Exploring systems, probe scanning down relic and data sites, and then hacking into the containers is one of my favoured ways of making ISK in EVE Online. It's a lot more chill than C3 wormhole ratting or Abyssal Dead Space running, two of my other chosen activities, though the ISK income is a little bit more variable to compensate for this. That said, with how chill it is, with how fun it is, I really don't mind. This is the perfect way for me to spend an afternoon where I don't want to hyper-focus and just have some fun seeing the site and sounds of New Eden. It's also really accessible to new players, it's an easy career to get into and opens up a lot of further possibilities down the line. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and in today's Cat Skull Academy lesson we're going to be learning the basics of hacking into relic and data sites. Please do note that this is not going to cover in-depth probe scanning that has been covered elsewhere, as is Wormhole Survival 101, and I do strongly recommend that you are familiar with both of those before you undock and give this a go. Otherwise though, let's jump right in. Now before I undock and show you how to scan down a relic or data site and then hack into the containers, we do first need to cover some basic theory. In this section I'm going to be talking about the different ships that you can use, the different fittings that you can use, we'll look at the skills, and we'll talk a little bit about the actual theory of the mini game that you're going to be attempting when you try to hack into one of these sites. Now again, familiarity with basic probe scanning does help here, but I will try to be as basic as I I can in this section of the video and it is also worth noting that I'm going to be covering things fairly quickly. A lot of it will make more sense when you reach the actual demonstration part later. So if you think you kind of understand but you're not really sure, stick with me. I promise it'll be a lot clearer once we see it in action. First of all then, let's talk about the different ship hulls. This is an exploration activity, right? So it does make sense that you would be using the Tier 1 Explorer frigates for this. Now if you're not sure what I mean by a Tier 1 Explorer frigate, basically it is a class of frigate that all four of the main empires have. For the Minmata Republic here, this is the Probe. For the Galente Federation, this would be the Imacus. For the Kaldari State, this is going to be the Heron. And for the Amar Empire, this will be the Magnate. This is a frigate that has bonuses towards hacking and exploring. If we look at the Minmatar Probe for an example here, you can see it has a roll bonus, a 5 plus bonus to Relic and Data Analyzer Virus Strength, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and then a Racial Frigate bonus to both Core and Combat Scanner Probe Strength. The Salvager Duration we don't need to worry about on this one here, but basically the Core and Combat Scanner Probe Strength is going to help us to scan down some of these smaller sites. We're going to be able to find them just that little bit quicker and easier, but that roll bonus to Relic and Data Analyzer of virus strength is the key part for hacking. Hopefully, as I said earlier, you should have a basic understanding of how probe scanning works, and so having a bonus to strength should be apparent to you that that is going to help you to scan down smaller sites. That said, the Relic and Data Analyzer virus strength does require a bit of explanation. You see, when you hack into a relic or data container, it is you versus that container's defenses. You are trying to find the core system, the system core of that container, and essentially destroy it. And during that mini game, you and the different defensive nodes around are going to have both virus strength and virus cohesion. Now the way to think of these is that strength is like your attack power. The higher the strength is, the more damage you do when you attack at the, uh, the, the systems in the container. And cohesion is kind of like your health. The more cohesion you have, the more hits back from the defenses you can take before you fail the hack. Now, obviously, as I said, this is both something that you have on your Relic and Data Analyzers, and different tiers of analyzers will change that. For example, a Data or Relic Analyzer 1 is not going to be as high in strength or cohesion as a Data or Relic Analyzer 2, and there are other alternative variants out there as well that do get bonuses to these things too. But it's worth noting here that the Probe, the Magnate, the Heron, and the Imacus all get that same Core and Combat Scanner Probe Strength bonus and that same Roll bonus. You can pretty much interchange between any of the four Tier 1 Explorer frigates as you wish. There is very little difference other than the fitting layout, and ultimately, again, a lot of that, when it comes down to it, your actual skills as a player doing the whole hacking minigame or the uh, scanning minigame 
are going to be more important than the differences between those ships. We then, once you've started using these and if you decide that this is a career that you enjoy, you could start looking at something like one of the fleet or navy issue variants. Again, it's the probe fleet issue, Heron navy issue, Magnate navy issue, and Imacus navy issue. Obviously, the Mimitar Republic being so awesome, we have a unique type of name with fleet issue, but hey. Now, like the standard probe, again, you get that bonus to core and combat scanner probe strength, 7.5% here on the probe. It is 7.5% on the basic probe as well well so there's no real difference there we then have a roll bonus that again is that five plus to relic and data analyzer you can kind of see here that these are very much the same for hacking and scanning the only difference really between a probe fleet issue and a probe is that the fleet issue gets a bonus to light missile and rocket rate of fire and a reduction to the scan probe launcher cpu requirements to help you fit a few other bits and pieces um, onto the ship I don't really recommend these for explorers, they're a decent whack, more expensive, and that split roll definitely has its niche in EVE Online, but not really for the kind of exploration we're talking about today. Now, if you are an Omega level pilot and you are looking to get the most out of this kind of gameplay, you can then come up to the Tech 2 Explorer frigates, which are found under the Covert Ops section. For the Minmatar Republic, that's the Cheetah, the Glente Federation get the Helios, the Kaldari State get the Buzzard, and the Amar Empire get the Arathema. Now, there are a few more differences between the four different ones here other than their slot layouts. For example, the Buzzard gets a bonus to scan deviation, which means if you're really struggling to pinpoint something down, the Buzzard might be a better option for you. The Cheetah, on the other hand, gets a bonus to ship maximum velocity whilst it's cloaked, which allows you to run gate camps that little bit easier. The differences are fairly minor, and again, your actual skills as a player in performing the mini games is going to outweigh which the ships you like. The Buzzard arguably is better at scanning down that little bit faster, but I really like the look of the Cheetah, which is why this is one of my flagships, the, uh, the Lucid Echo. If we look at the roll bonuses and stats though here on the Cheetah, you can see that you get a Covert Ops bonus. Yes, indeed, there's a roll bonus as well. Covert Ops cloaking devices can be fitted with the activation time reduced by five seconds and a reduced cloaking device CPU requirement to help you fit these to your ship. Rather than the 7.5% core and combat scanner probe strength that we had before, this is now a 10% per skill level here. So again, you're going to get much higher combat on core scanner strength, um, which is going to help you nail down those small the sites that a little bit faster. There's also a 10% reduction in the time required for survey probe scans so that they just cycle a little bit faster. That whole blue light going across when you're scanning, when it's on a cheetah or a buzzard or an anathema or a helios, it's that little bit faster. There is the racial frigate bonus again. This is, again, this time just to do with the cloaking devices um, on this one. It's the reduction in maximum, uh, sorry, the bonus to maximum velocity when using a cloaking device on the buzzard. That would be the scan deviation reduction. And then a reduction in warp drive capacitor need, which is, again, the same across all four. It's the bonus to ship maximum velocity and scan deviation that swaps between the different hull types. But ultimately, which one you go for is going to depend really on what skills you have if you're Minmatar than the Cheetah makes sense, right? And the actual differences between them are fairly minimal. It's worth mentioning there are some other ships that you can use in the Servant Sisters of Eve. There is, of course, the Astero. We're not going to talk about it in this video because it's not that much better than the others once you're a good player, especially for hacking and uh, relic scanning, uh, relic and data sites. This is more of a combat scanner for the, for the most part. It does do well in things like the ghost sites and some of the sleeper caches as well, but again, that's beyond the scope of this video. The same goes for the pacifier. There is the Concord pacifier frigate, which has some really cool bonuses to scanning and clover, uh, covert ops, but it's also an incredibly expensive frigate. We're looking around 200, 220 million just for the hull, add the fittings on, and it's just a very expensive ship to lose if you're not careful, so I, I can't really recommend it. I have one, but it pretty much sits docked in my hangar. Now, if we go across to cruisers, you can also come up to the strategic cruiser. Some people do use these for scanning and hacking, but again, I don't really recommend it. If you're going to be going down the whole process of going for relic and data site scanning and hacking, at least as far as this video is concerned, you kind of want to focus mainly on either the tier one explorer frigates or the tier two. 
It is n worth noting that the m one of the big differences that not a lot of people consider between the Tech 2 Covert Ops and the standard Tech 1 Exploration Frigates is also their cargo size. The standard Tech 1s have a 400 cubic meter hold car uh, cargo, whereas the Tech 2s only have a 250 cubic meter cargo. If you're just doing short runs, this isn't huge, and it's why ultimately I tend to still prefer using the Cheetah, but if you want to go on a longer excursion, you might find the Tech 1 variants give you just that little bit more cargo which means you're not gonna have to turn around and come home as soon next up let's talk about the relevant skills for scanning and hacking if you come into the skill book and open the skill catalog you then look for the scanning menu it's here at the middle at the bottom here this is the one we're going to be looking into and how much do i love scanning i've trained all 35 levels of the seven different relevant skills cool Great little uh, income here. I love this playstyle so much. Now, the first thing we're going to need to know is the astrometrics skill, because this also does form a basis for a lot of the other skills in this segment. You're going to need to level this up to max out some of the others as well. This essentially is your skill at operating long range scanners. You get a plus 5% scan strength per level. So at full five, that's a 25% scan boost strength on its own. That's pretty cool. A reduction to maximum scan deviation. So there's less distance between the original suggested point and the final actual point that you scan down, and then a 25% total reduction to scan probe scan time per level as well, so they scan faster. Brilliant skill, very important for helping you to scan sites down quickly and easily. Efficiency is obviously the key to a lot of things in EVE. This skill is absolute baseline. Beyond this, we then have the archaeology and the hacking skill. These both do exactly the same thing, but for the different sides of relic and data. Obviously, the hacking skill here, this is used in data sites. When This is going to benefit your data analyzer modules. It's a plus 10 virus cohesion per level trained. And remember, virus cohesion is kind of the health of your attack through the, uh, the system that you're attacking. So more health means you are less likely to die and fail the hack. On the other side, we have Archaeology. This, again, exactly the same thing. 10, uh, 10 points of virus coherence per level of the Archaeology skill, but this time benefiting Relic Analyzer modules. This helps you with the Relic sites, as you'd guess from the name. Really useful if you're having a bit of a mare going through some of these containers and you're finding that you keep dying in the containers, you keep failing the hack. These skills can be the first thing that you aim for because they will increase the virus coherence. It's also worth noting you're going to want those higher tier relic and data analyzers as well. So if we go into show info, you will see that there are bonuses for training these up to different levels. At level one, you gain access to the basic relic analyzer and the ligature integrated analyzer, which is basically a relic and data analyzer that only takes up one slot rather than the two. Really cool, right? We then have level two gives us some technology that we don't need to worry about. Level three gives us another one of the integrated analyzers, the Frostline Clavicula, but this is quite an expensive module. And at full uh, tier five, you get Relic Analyzer 2 or the Zoigma integrated analyzer. Again, very expensive, but I do love that module to pieces. The same here goes for hacking. If you get hacking all the way to level five, you unlock the uh, data analyzer too. And these are so worth having for the rather large jump in the ability to hack into containers. Well worth getting both of those skills up to five if you are interested in this. But what about these other three? Astrometric acquisition, astrometric pinpointing, and astrometric range finding. Well, basically, these are going to help you find the sites a little bit easier. The astrometric range finding, you can see here, it's an additional 5% increase to scan probe strength. Really nice to help you find those smaller and harder to pinpoint sites. Pinpointing means you get less deviation. So, you know, when you scan something and it kind of moves off to the side, you get less of that going on. And astrometric acquisition is these probe scan time per level so you scan faster none of these are overly vital the range finding definitely is the more important of those three the other two i find just make it that little bit easier and faster whereas this one actually is going to help you scan down some of the smaller sites that you might not be able to with the lower tier skills and lower tier equipment 
Basically, for the purposes of skills, the ones you want to be focusing on are astrometrics, followed by archaeology, hacking, and astrometric rangefinding. Bring up the pinpointing and acquisition when you can. They are still worth having, absolutely. I just don't think you really need them. It's also worth talking about survey for a brief moment. This is essentially your ability using survey scan modules. Um, this is when you can sort of like ship scanning modules, you can scan someone's cargo hold to see what's in. You can get cargo scanners. These will allow you to actually scan the different boxes in a relic and data site. If you go down that route, it can be a very useful tool because if you don't want to be in a site for too long, you can quickly scan a box and see whether or not it's even worth your time to bother opening it. Nothing worse than spending a few minutes opening a box, maybe failing a hack and having to try again, only to open it up and get nothing more than carbon. Very, very useful if you want to just make things a little bit easier for yourself in return in terms of time spent in the uh, in the actual relic or data site. That said, absolutely not vital and we're not going to focus on it for this video. Lastly then, before we undock, let's talk about the different modules you'll be using. Now I've dragged in a Data Analyzer 1, Data Analyzer 2, Ligature Integrated Analyzer, and Zoigma Integrated Analyzer into the compare tool to discuss the differences. I haven't bothered adding Relic Analyzers here because they're exactly the same as Data Analyzers, just obviously they work on the other boxes. So when you first start out with the hacking and exploration, you're probably only going to have the skills to fit a Data Analyzer 1. It's still a pretty solid module. You've got a virus coherence of 40, which is your health, remember, and a virus strength of 20. It's basic, but it does get boosted up based on skills and on the ship hulls. If this is fit to a probe, that virus strength is already at 25, for example, which actually is a pretty big difference. If something you're attacking has a coherence of 50, then with virus strength 20, you're going to need to attack it three times to kill it, whereas with virus strength 25, you're only going to need to attack it twice. It can make a big difference. And remember, every skill point that you put into the data analyzer skill of hacking is going to increase the virus coherence by 10 as well. So that is going to get a lot bigger quite quickly. Once we are upgraded all the way to hacking level 5, you're going to have the data analyzer 2 unlocked. And the same goes for obviously archaeology 5, unlocking the relic analyzer 2. These are quite a big step up. Again, the virus coherence basic goes from 40 to 60, so you're getting an additional half 50% additional health on your uh, on your virus attack and the virus strength goes from 20 to 30 as well which is a nice 50% boost there again that then means on a probe you're now getting say 35 virus strength which means something with 70 health is now getting taken out in two hits whereas with a basic data analyzer one that would have been what four hits <laughs> it's a, it's a big difference it's a big difference going up to a data analyzer two from a data analyzer one now, it's worth noting that that difference in optimal range is pretty much negligible. If you're doing it right, you should be approaching your containers and sitting between 2,500 to 2,000 meters away. By being further than 2,000 meters, if someone jumps you, you can hit your cloak and you won't drop cloak as you fly away, as long as you don't fly towards the container, of course. On the other hand, by being within 2,500 meters, the second you complete the hack, you can open the container, claim your loot, and move on. It is worth noting that, that it, the, the main difference here is essentially between the strength and coherences. Now, when you first start out, obviously you can only fit a data analyzer one, but you can also go straight into a ligature integrated analyzer if you wish. So let's have a look at how that compares side by side. Well, you can see they've got the same virus strength and the same optimal range, not that the optimal range matters, and the virus coherence is where the big difference is. The coherence on a standard data analyzer one is 40, where it's only 20 on the ligature, it's half. This may seem like a huge problem at first, but remember that the ligature, the integrated analyzers, both benefit from the archaeology and the hacking skill. So as you level those up, and instead of just, you know, the hacking skill adding 10 points of coherence to your data analyzers, and the archaeology skill adding 10 points of cohesion to your uh, relic analyzers, if you've got one point in both hacking and archaeology, that is going to increase the ligature by 10 from hacking, 10 from uh, archaeology, a total of 20 health. So it does very quickly actually outperform the data analyzer if you're doing both. 
The same is true for the Zoigma Integrated Analyzer. It has the same virus strength as the Data Analyzer 2, but considerably lower coherence. But the coherence again doesn't matter all that much, considering you're going to be getting bonuses from both archaeology and from hacking. So why wouldn't you just use a Ligature or a Zoigma Integrated? Well, the simple reason is their cost. Check out how much these cost on the market compared to the basic analyzers. Look at the cost of a Data Analyzer 1 plus a Relic Analyzer 1 compared to a Ligature Integrated Analyzer. Compare the difference between a Data Analyzer 2 and a Relic Analyzer 2 combined, and then a Zoigma Integrated Analyzer. You can fit, you can pick up Data Analyzers really quite cheap on the market, a couple of uh, million here and there. Whereas the Zoigmas will consistently go for anywhere from 70,000, uh, sorry, 70 million up to 100 million. That is a significant dis uh, difference in price. And ultimately, the fact that it only takes up one mid slot for the integrated sounds amazing until you start looking at your Explorer ship and realizing that extra mid slot doesn't really do much for you. I tend to use integrateds on things like the Tengu because I've got a ship there that does both combat sites and relic and data sites. Therefore, the mid slot is very beneficial for those combat sites. But when you're just flying around in one of the Explorer frigates, it's so much more cost efficient just to stick with the data analyzer and relic analyzer combo. Use both of them rather than an integrated. First of all, then, we need to actually find ourselves a relic or data site, which means we need to look for cosmic signatures. Cosmic signatures are items that when you scan them down, they reveal themselves to either be a relic or data site, a wormhole, a combat site, a gas site, or maybe some other things as well. Now, you can just fly around with your probe interface open and look for cosmic signatures to appear when you arrive in a new system, but there is a significantly easier way using the agency. So if we come up to the Neocom and click on the Agency here on the left, or we can use the default keybind of Alt and M, when this opens, we go to Exploration here along the top, and then to Cosmic Signatures. This will then show every system nearby that has unscanned Cosmic Signatures in it. And you can see that here I've got three in this system. Across a jump here, we've got a six that I could go to and scan through. And if you're wondering why on earth I'm in Nullsec right now, it's because when you're scanning for relic and data sites, don't just look for relic and data sites, do keep your eye on wormholes as well. I went through four different systems near me and I found no relic or data sites, but I found a few wormholes. I jumped into a couple of those and I tried those for relic or data sites, didn't have much luck. But I did find this wormhole through to Nullsec, so I thought I'd give that a go. And sure enough, the first site that I scanned down in this system was a relic site. You can tell it's a relic site because it has the relic site icon for it and it will tell you this when you mouse over it. Data sites look like a little grid as well um, so you can see what those are straight away. Now when we mouse over this the name actually tells us some important information as well. It tells us what sites you want to look for and which ones you want to avoid like the plague because not all relic and data sites are made equal. We don't want to find ourselves a sleeper cache or a ghost site or sleeper sites because those have dangerous mechanics in them for us. Things like boxes exploding or rats appearing or in the case of the sleeper sites, it's basically a combat anomaly that just happens to have a couple of uh, hacking boxes in there as well. No, we are looking for what I refer to as the vanilla type sites. These can be found in high sec, low sec, null sec and inside wormholes and which ones you find will depend on where you are. Now, if we look at the name here, you can tell these instantly. If it's a relic site, it's going to have a name like Decayed, Ruined, or Crumbling. That means it's a relic site. If it's a data site, it's going to have a name like Local, Regional, or Central. And that tells us that it is a safe data site. So look for those names first of all. And if you see something like Unsecured, don't bother. Forgotten, don't bother. Just look for, once more, Crumbling, Decayed, Ruined, Local, Regional, or Central. Those are the six names you want to consider at this point. Those tell you what kind of site you're looking at. They also tell you a little bit about the difficulty of that site, because not all sites even there are created equal. If you're in high sec, you'll f primarily find crumbling relic sites or local data sites. When you move into low sec, you'll start to find decayed relic sites and regional data sites. 
When you come down to Nullsec, you'll be looking at ruined relic sites and central data sites. This tells you a little bit about the difficulty of the boxes and the kind of loot inside, but they are completely safe. So if you do happen to find yourself one of the Nullsec variants, if you're in a wormhole for example, give it a go. The worst thing you can do is lose all of the loot. You won't lose your ship and you will have gotten yourself some good practice. Now, the one I'm looking at here, it's a ruined Serpentis site. And that Serpentis, again, it tells us what kind of loot is in there, and that's based on the area of space we're in. Because I'm out in Fountain, Fountain is a Serpentis rat area. If you're fighting angel rats, then it's going to be angel relic and data sites near you. If you're fighting Guristus rats, it's going to be Guristus relic and data sites. Simple as that, and that kind of tells you what kind of loot is inside them. If you're inside a wormhole, however, it's entirely possible to scan down, uh, say, a Guristus data site and a Sansha relic site right next to each other. Wormholes will spawn cross-faction relic and data sites. Worth remembering, because it means that wormholes can be incredibly lucrative for that, because you don't have to, if you're based in angel space, you don't have to sail all the way across the galaxy to try and find yourself Serpentis or Guristas or Blood Raider loot. It's right there on your doorstep if you go into a wormhole. Anyway, the final bit of this name, the Science Outpost, can actually be used to tell us how many boxes are going to be in there and what type of containers they are, but we're not going to stress this too much. This is beyond the scope of this video, but it can be used for identification. Now, I'm going to warp within 10 meters because I'm currently cloaked up. We get a nice little bit of flavor text here about what this science about. We're going to close that down and we're going to let ourselves warp in. My cheetah is, of course, cloaked. Now, when you're in a wormhole site or a nullsec site, you should theoretically create what's called a perch. It's a bookmark that's usually around about 150, 200 kilometers away from the drop-in point. This means you can warp to that bookmark, warp to a box, hack into that box, and the second you finished hacking that box, you loot it and you warp back to the bookmark. And then you can move quickly between all of the different boxes. You go you basically box, perch, box, perch, box, perch. Kind of like a kingfisher jumping into the water, I guess, hence the name. Now that we're in the site, though, with our exploration overview visible, you can see there are some boxes here. We have Serpentis Remains, a few of those, and some Serpentis Ruins. Again, those names do tell us the difficulty of the boxes and possibly the type of loot that we might find inside, but we're not going to stress this too much. What I am going to need to do is, essentially, we're going to right-click on one of these, and we're going to go Keep at Range, 2,500 meters, and we're going to drift towards this box. Because I'm in null sec, I'm doing this a little bit more carefully than you might do if you're in high sec, for example, but obviously this is going to be pretty true for doing uh, some of the wormhole sites as well, where you want to be that little bit more careful. And of course, we're going to keep using D-Scan to make sure that there's no one around us, because, oh, there are people nearby. I've come a little bit close to this box. It's going to pull me a little bit further away. Remember, we want to be around the 2,500 mark. Somewhere between 2,500 and uh, 2,000 means we can use the cloak as soon as someone drops in because we're more than 2,000 meters. But being in 2,500 means we can also open the container instantly. Right, now here's where I have to be careful because I'm no longer cloaked. I've got the box locked, this is a relic site, so we're going to use a relic analyzer. And lo and behold, here is the hacking minigame. Now this interface, we need to have a look at. On the left hand side here, you have your virus coherence, which is, again, its health, and it's de detailed as a number here, maximum 110. I have a virus strength of 40, denoted by this red line here. That means I deal 40 damage to something when I click on it. Here is my starting point, and here is the grid. I need to find the system core somewhere on this grid, destroy it, and that will open the box. So how do we do this? Well, I can click on any one of these that lights up when I go over it. So I can go onto this one, and that's going to tell me three. That means there is something within three nodes. So for example, one, two, three in this corner, or one, two, three across here, so on, so forth. Now, this essentially is kind of like playing Minesweeper. So we're going to click another one of these. This is now only two away, so this could be theoretically possible. Two, uh, up this way, we're getting closer. Let's go in. One. Is there anything in this corner? Yes, there is. This is what is known as a utility subsystem. These are special bonus items that you can use to make this hack easier. And if I click this, it will add it down to my utility bar here. Remember how we saw that the ligature and the Zoigma analyzers only had one utility, uh, utility slot? 
It's not huge because you can kind of just use the one you've got and then pick up another one, but it means you've got less choice as to which one you use first. Worth bearing in mind. Now in this case, this utility subsystem is the polymorphic shield. If I use that, then the next two defense nodes that attack me are going to bounce off the shield rather than dealing damage to my virus. But now we're going to continue working our way through here. So, oh, straight onto a defensive node. This is going to have 50 coherence and it's going to do 40 damage to me if it survives. I'm only going to do 40 damage to it, so I'm not going to kill it on my first click, which means it's done 40 damage to me, dropping my coherence to 70. Next time, I'm going to kill it though, and if you kill it, it doesn't attack you back. You kind of get to go first. This time around, however, because I know I'm not going to kill that and 40 damage is a lot, I am going to click on that shield. So now when I hit this, it goes to do 40 back, but it hits the shield instead. I then do 40 back to it and I kill it. And now we can, crikey, there are so many of these things here. That's painful, but okay, we've gotten through, we can keep going round. I've now got another utility subsystem. This is Kernel Rot. Kernel Rot essentially halves the coherence of a defense subsystem or system core. Brilliant for just bringing something down if it's nice and big. Like if something's got 80 health, you can slash it to 40 and then I can kill it in one go with my hits. Now, there's also a thing in hacking known as the rule of six. If you ever find a node like this one that has all six hexagon nodes around it, so not like, for example, these ones here that don't have all six around them, and it comes up with a one, you know, uh, it's, if it's a node in the center, you know that the thing on the outside is always going to be the system core. Now, for, as it matters here, that's not the problem. We're going to try and move down. I reckon it's going to be down in this corner. It could be up here, but we're going to go down this way. And we're going to get hit with every subsystem en route. Uh, it's going to be 40 damage, and I'm going to half that down to 25 so that I kill it on the first click. Three, four. No, we're getting further away, so we are going to go up this way. Two, one. And in the corner, it's going to be this one here. There we are. It's just a defensive node. That's not the end. Nasty bit of damage, two away, possibly this one here, because two doesn't go anywhere else. It can only be here. This is probably going to be the system core. Now, before I click this, it's worth noting that you don't necessarily have to attack all of the systems that are around you. If you hit a defensive subsystem, you can often just continue around it and ignore it. There are a couple you need to be very, very aware of that when they appear, you do not ignore them. Those are referred to as restoration nodes and suppressors. Suppressors reduce your attack. Restoration nodes continue to give everything else around them coherence, making them significantly tougher. Ultimately, though, we should be pretty good now just to click. I don't know, it's not the end. It's another one of these blasted things. So we're going to take that out there. So when you see a five, five doesn't necessarily mean it's five away. Five is the maximum. It cannot be, f like, it can be further than five, but you'll never see a six on a number. Five could mean it's six or seven away, but you'll still see the five. Anyway, we're coming now down towards the bottom. Oof, that's painful. And there is the final thing itself. It's got 70 health, ideal 40 damage, which means I'll kill it in two clicks. Unfortunately, it's going to do 10 damage back to me, and I've only got 10 health. Now, I can start looking around to see if I can find a resource node that maybe gives me something perfect. There we go, like a kernel rot again. Now I can halve this down to 35, and I can kill it in one hit. Never give up when you are hacking. There are all kinds of cool little tricks you can do. Let's open up the cargo. So I said I'm slightly too far away, literally 55 meters over. There we are. What did we get? Let's just grab it because I want to be able to start moving towards the next container. Lock the next container. Unlock that one. Start to move towards it. Now, I did mention that I tend to just go through and loot everything these days, but you will notice that on my uh, bar here, I do have a cargo scanner. This again, 70 kilometer range, you can lock onto a target. Let's go with this one at 24 k's away. Of course, I've got to be within 23 to lock, haven't I? <laughs> there we are, sorry. Now we're in 23, let's lock onto that, and we'll utilize the cargo scanner just to showcase how this works. That's gonna cycle. Once it's cycled, it's gonna tell us what's in there, 10 interface circuits. You might decide that's worth you doing, you might decide that's not worth you doing. 
For the purposes of this video though, I am now done. That is everything to show you guys. You understand utility subsystems, you understand how to go through the hacking minigame, how to find the sites, and you understand that by now you should be using uh, Dscan a lot more than I currently am. I'm really being very bad at that. I am going to keep at range. I'm gonna finish off this site. But otherwise, folks, thank you for watching. I do hope this helps. If you laughed at all, if you found it useful, please do hit like on the video. It massively helps. And if you do wanna go the extra mile to help support this channel, I have a PayPal, I have a Patreon page you can pledge to support at. Um, you get your name in the stars at the end of the video. And I do have a Redbubble merchandise store as well if you fancy getting yourself some really cool looking swag um, regarding my channel and EVE Online. Otherwise, folks, I hope it's been useful. Let me know how you get on doing all of this. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.